Good morning, West Valley Foursquare Church. My name is Savannah Edgerly, and I usually serve at the church on Sunday mornings as an usher. Um, I want to bring a couple words of encouragement to you this morning, and um, hopefully you get something from this. I've been reading up on the word lament and what it means to lament, and um, I think right now, during everything that's happening in the world, it's hard sometimes to see that God is still working and that He is with us through these difficult times. And so I encourage you to turn towards God instead of towards despair, which seems to be the easier thing to do. I think the big act of faith is knowing that God is still with you during those difficult times. So a good passage to read is Psalm 13. And there are many others in the Bible, but I encourage you to kind of read that and maybe meditate on what that means for you um, and for some things that maybe you're going through in your life right now. Okay, on to the announcements. Um, no Kid Hungry. I know there's a lot of things canceled right now, but No Kid Hungry is not canceled. It's still going on and the church is still in need of food items. Um, you can visit the church website, it's wvfc.church to find out what they are in need of um, every week. And um, I think that right now it's hard to be in touch with people. Um, our routines have changed and we're used to seeing everybody every week at church, um, but now we're not. So we are trying hard to stay connected with you. And one of those ways is through the church's Facebook page. Um, check in a few times a week and see what's happening with the church. Uh, we like to post events and news and um, Pastor Andrew posts a devotional three times a week. And um, they're just great. They're deep and he has so much wisdom to share. So I encourage you to tune in to those. Um, other ways we're trying to keep in touch is through a weekly newsletter that we're sending to you via email on Sunday evenings, so please keep a lookout for those um, and stay connected with us because that's what we are trying to do. Um, and the last thing is that mentor groups are starting. We This is like a, a year long um, commitment, so it is a big commitment, but it is so good and so wholesome and you can just pray about that and think about joining. Um, there's so much growth for you as an individual, growth with your mentor group, and also in your walk with the Lord. Um, and the last thing is tithes. We are still receiving, receiving tithes, not in person, but you can mail your check to the church, and you can set up bill pay through your bank account, or you can do it through our app that we have with the church. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, enjoy the service. Open. 
Everything, everything.
This morning, we are excited to celebrate and honor these 15 individuals who have just completed Mentor Group. Mentor Group is a 10-month commitment that they have faithfully stuck with and finished. They have read 10 different books. They have read through the New Testament as well as memorized scripture. They have grown in the things of God, and we are excited to see where this past season is going to carry them as they move forward into the seasons to come. Hello everyone, thank you so much for continually inviting us into your home as we do this online church experience together. I really do pray that you're thriving and not just surviving in this prolonged quarantine, much longer than we ever anticipated. I'm sure a lot more adverse effects than we uh, emotionally and physically than we, we were counting on. But I thank you for continually tuning in and watching these videos. Hopefully you're digging deep. I really sincerely pray that you're thriving and not surviving, that you're reading your Bible, that you're spending time in prayer, that you're engaged in life group, that you're being intentional about hanging out with friends and ways that you can so that you can stay in community, watching devotional videos and teachings and just doing those things that help us grow in Christ. I hope that you're doing those things. Well, we are still in our Mark series, a longer series than we're used to. This is going to be 16 weeks because we're going a chapter at a time. But I pray that you're blessed by benefiting from it. Hopefully, hopefully it's helpful as a devotional. You read a chapter and then listen to a message for that chapter. I hope that you're doing that in the weeks to come and maybe even going back and finding the videos and reading the chapter and listening to the message. And I really pray that it blesses you, challenges you, encourages you, giving, gives you insight for what Christ has for you. I mean that sincerely. Well, here we are in Mark chapter 12, and right out of the gate, Jesus gives a confrontational parable, but there's so much to learn. So let's dive right in to Mark chapter 12. It says that Jesus began teaching them with stories, or that is parables. A man planted a vineyard, Jesus said. He built a wall around it, he dug a pit for pressing out grape juice and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed the servant, beat him, and sent him back empty-handed. The owner then sent another servant, and they insulted him and beat him over the head. The next servant he sent was killed. Others he sent were either beaten or killed until there was only one left, his son, whom he loved dearly. The owner finally sent him, thinking, well, surely they will respect my son. But the tenant farmer said to one another, here comes the heir of the estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him and murdered him and threw his body out of the vineyard. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do? Jesus asked. I tell you, he will come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. Didn't you ever read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. The religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus because they realized he was telling the story against them, that they were the wicked farmers. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. I love the irony of that last part. Now, in the New Living Translation, which really helps to connect the dots for newer readers of the Bible. It says that they were the wicked farmers, but in the original text, it doesn't say that. That's of course implied. In, in other translations, you're gonna read that uh, the Pharisees or the religious leaders were angry because they perceived that Jesus was talking about them, and, and rightfully so he was. But New Living connects the dots for us. But the irony of that last part strikes me because they're angry with Jesus, 
because he is talking about them that they're the wicked farmers in this parable, but Jesus and the others by God have been sent to help them. And yet they're angry about that. So the irony of that kind of strikes me. I think it's interesting that they were unwilling to help, uh, to receive the help that God was sending their way, including the very Son of God, His beloved Son. Now, of course, we want to understand what this parable means and what it's teaching us. And there are multiple layers to it and many ways to understand Scripture and to approach Scripture accurately. But certainly with the parables, we, we have a little bit of work to do. And so we want to really understand what Jesus is teaching here. And so let's do this. Let's look at the first layer of meaning and then see what the Holy Spirit says to us as we sort of unpack this parable. And, and I believe that we're going to be able to be challenged and growth. It's not only a confrontational parable to the Pharisees, we're going to find that it can be even lovingly confrontational to us as well. The first layer of understanding this parable is that, is that Jesus really is talking about the Israelites. Uh, he's talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about his visit to earth as God in the flesh. The picture here of a man planting a vineyard and then leasing it to the tenants and building a fence or really building a wall around it is a picture of God choosing Israel to be his representative, his chosen people. I mean, this takes us all the way back certainly to the promise that God gives Abraham, the covenant that God makes with Abraham way back in Genesis. But, but it really talks about, let's go all the way back to Joshua uh, inheriting the promised land that God gave as an inheritance to the nation of Israel. And then fast forwarding to King David, the great King David over the nation of Israel, where he is able to solidify Jerusalem as both the political and the religious capital of Israel. So now Jerusalem is home base for Israel. And during all of that time, even into his son building the temple, his son Solomon building the temple, uh, Israel is established as a nation. They're God's chosen people. And they're supposed to be the ones that show the world, show the earth how to interact with God. This is the one true God, the one that's worthy of our worship. And this is how you interact with him. And this is how you have a relationship with God. They were supposed to be missional in that respect. Pointing, to, uh, pointing the other nations towards God. But instead, they chose to be selfish. They chose to follow idols, which really means they tried to find comfort in other things or they were swayed by popular culture. Instead, they chose selfishness. And so God sends prophets. God sends messengers. This is sort of the story of the Jewish scriptures or what we call the Old Testament. Jesus, I'm sorry, God sends prophets. He sends messengers to try to get Israel back on track. Stay focused, stay the course. You're God's chosen people. You're God's representative here on earth. And so they're the ones that are challenging Israel, the prophets, the messengers. They're the ones that are saying, uh, we're calling you out of your sin. You know, you wake up, you know, you can't serve these idols and uh, they can't even speak. And we're calling for justice. They're calling for right and true worship. They're calling for right and true lifestyle and actions and even opinions. This is God's thoughts on the matter. Stop chasing idols, they would say. Stop worshiping other things in your life when only God alone should be worshiped. And really, only God alone is the one worthy of worship. They would say things like care for the foreigners, care for the poor, love people, live your life in a way that honors God. But the Israelites, how did they receive it? Man, they were offended, right? They were offended by the message of the prophets. They were offended by the messengers that God had sent only to right the path, to correct the ship. They were offended and frustrated by the prophets telling them to, how to live their life. They were offended and frustrated by the prophets bringing to their attention what they were doing was wrong or questionable. So they treated them poorly. They treated them harshly sometimes. And we can look back at Israel's history and we can see the incredible missed opportunity before us, especially when we consider what Jesus is saying in that parable. That one short parable just loaded with all of Israel's history. They're God's chosen people. God sent messengers and prophets. Man, they would not listen. They would not heed. But that's Jesus's point here in the parable. It's all loaded 
but that's his point in the parable. These tenants are supposed to be representatives of the owner of his, of his vineyard. The tenants are supposed to be doing a great job, and yet they treat the incoming servants from the owner so poorly. They beat them, they kill them, they mock them, and then they send them away empty-handed. I mean, even that alone has meaning. This means that either the vineyard was not producing fruit, which means that the tenants weren't doing their job, or if it was producing fruit, but yet these guys from the owners came and left empty-handed, it means that the tenants were not honoring the owner. They were being greedy and selfish with the produce of the land. And God gives us a lot of blessings. Do we honor him with that, or do we just get greedy and ask for more and are not willing to give back what God has given us? So then Jesus moves into the final and main point that God, who is the owner of the vineyard, sends his son to get through to these people, to reach this people, these tenants that are supposed to be representative of God. He sends his own beloved son, and he uses that term, his dearly beloved or his beloved son. This is hearkening back to the baptism and the transfiguration. Uh, We know here that they're talking, that Jesus is talking about himself in this parable. And he said that they killed him. He was sent to reach them. But these people killed his son and put him out of the vineyard. And by putting him out of the vineyard, it's a pretty amazing picture. Because what we see is that the city wall around Jerusalem, Golgotha, the hill where Jesus was crucified, was just outside the city. And so Jesus is even predicting his death. In this parable, he's saying, yep, you're going to kill the son. You're going to take him outside the city wall, outside the vineyard and kill him and leave his body there. Man. And so the vineyard is going to be given to others. What does that even mean? Well, it's an allusion to bringing the vineyard to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to be grafted in. I'm thinking of Romans chapter 11. The Gentiles, anyone who is not a Jew, the Gentiles are going to be grafted into the family of God. That's what is the picture here. You guys have been stiff-necked and stubborn. God's going to send a judgment and the Gentile nations will be brought in. So it's a cool picture just at the first layer of meaning, which is what the audience, the original audience would have heard Jesus to say. Isn't that amazing? I think parables are so profound that way because they're so much, they're so rich. But there's another layer to consider. See, that, that is this context, this first layer of understanding the parable is profound and, there, and it, it really is truly so rich, but there's so much more to glean. Let's consider this. When you give your heart to Christ, when you put your trust in Jesus. When I put my trust and faith in Him, we're now part of the church. We're a part of this thing called the body of believers, the church. And the church is God's representative here on the earth to be a light in this dark world and to show people how we're supposed to relate with and interact with the one true God. And that's part of our mission. You see the similarity? You see the overlap between the the nation of Israel as God's chosen people and how they were supposed to represent God. And now the church is supposed to be the light in the darkness and represent God here on earth. Now the church, of course, it's not the building. It's not here where I'm standing recording this message. And unfortunately in a pandemic, we can't meet together physically, which is lacking because of the fact that getting together in community is a vital part of the church, but we will get back there. But just because we can't meet in a building, the church doesn't stop right? Uh, that's for sure the truth, because we, we are the church. You and I are the church. And whether we're physically gathering in this building or not, the mission of God is not stalled by an unsurprised pandemic. So we can take heart and take faith in that. But we become God's representative on earth. We can now sort of, on another layer, see ourselves in the parable. And I think that God puts people in our life to guide us and to correct us and to call us out into growth so that we can stay on track and on mission as a church, corporately and even individually. Certainly, I think of the Apostle Paul who was brought into the church and uh, planted churches and challenged existing churches and challenged the apostles of Jesus, and he sharpened them and they sharpened him. Man, I, I think of relationship causes us to grow, or it's supposed to. Just like that owner sending servants into the vineyard, God sends people into our life to challenge us, to keep our course straight, to do course corrections at times. God puts people in your life for a reason. How do you treat those who challenge you to grow 
in Christ? That's a tough question. It, it reminds me of a story, a true story. A friend of mine who grew up in Brazil, grew up and became a Christian church in Brazil, and as a young adult moved over into here into America, got involved in the church here, and then after a few years, he was able to really learn the church culture and see the differences. And I remember talking with him, what have you learned? And tell me about home and all that kind of stuff. And he would tell me, I was so surprised actually. He said, you know, Andrew, the thing that's so interesting is when I grew up in the church culture in Brazil and we really were more of a family. If you called yourself a Christian, I had the right to speak into your life and say, you know, you shouldn't be treating your spouse that way or you shouldn't talk to your kids that way or, or that conduct is not becoming of a Christian or you shouldn't be posting or saying or doing those things. But he said over here in America, it's just not that way. We're very individualistic. We're very uh, offendable. I mean, there's just not that freedom to talk to each other. And he said, so I'm kind of trying to learn the church culture here. And, and I've stepped on some toes that I didn't mean to. I was just trying to help. Isn't that interesting? My experience is that that's very true. I think it's a sad truth about our church culture, our American church culture. There just really isn't as much freedom as there should be for us to just in love, I'm talking about in context of love. I'm not talking about that loose cannon who's just flying off the handle trying to find everything wrong with what we're doing. I'm talking about in context. There's just not enough freedom for us to say the hard things to each other. It's like we really have to have a lot of relational equity in order for me to say something to you or for you to say something to me. There's, there has to be this relational equity before I'm willing to listen or you may be willing to listen. It's an interesting thing to consider, but I think we're just too sensitive. We're just far too sensitive. And I, I believe that God uses people to encourage us and to challenge us, and that God puts people in our life to help us grow. We need community to grow. This is where you can't be a Christian on an island by yourself. It just doesn't work. Read the book of Acts. Man, we talk about that boldly in the growth track that we have here at the church. And that's the whole purpose of life groups, a significant relationship, because community, man, community matters. Community is a part of our growth. So as we try to land the plane here, do you have people in your life who bring these kinds of things to your attention from time to time? Do you have someone in your life who will say the hard things, again, with the purpose of growth, not just to be a jerk or not just to make you frustrated or, or push your buttons, but they're honestly trying to help you grow. They challenge you on how well you listen or maybe how poorly you, you listen, or, or maybe they challenge you on how you talk to your kids. Think about those kinds of conversations. Is there someone in your life that is, this, that's not a good way to talk to your kids, or you know, you've lost your temper, you've been frustrated, or that's not how you should talk to your spouse, or maybe you could be more loving with your spouse, or someone who challenge you, challenges you in your work ethic. They, maybe they would say something hard, like, you know what, I'm gonna be honest with you, you're, you're a procrastinator. You know, you're a little slippery to get a hold of when you say you're gonna do something, I'm not sure if you're gonna be faithful or not, or commit or not, you're kinda, you don't really do the stuff you say you're gonna do. Is there someone in your life that can say the hard thing, or? Or maybe you're so detail driven, you actually step on people. You don't, you don't, it seems like you don't care about the people when you're focused on a project. You have someone that can speak to you that way. Someone that can say, you know, I think you, you're a little proud, actually. You're, you're a little bit arrogant. You know, you always have to be right or you always have to get the last word in a conversation. You, you really don't like to be challenged. When you feel like you're right on something, you really don't like to be challenged to look at other viewpoints. Or someone who would say, you know what, my friend, you are out of control on your social media. You're out of control. You are saying things that, that's compromising your witness to Christ. And you may think you're being funny or you may think you're just venting, but my friend, you are compromising your witness on social media. Do you have someone in your life like that? Don't you think we need people in our life like that? And if we were to say, no, I don't need people like that, I got it together. I think the problem that we're going to find out is that pride, pride is deceptive and pride is what's going to take us down. I hope you do. I hope you have people in your life who love you enough to tell you the truth. And in fact, maybe God has placed West Valley Foursquare Church in your life. Maybe he's brought you here, connected you to this body. Maybe you're watching this and, and you're, you've never stepped in this building, West Valley Foursquare Church, but you've been connected through our online presence in 
this pandemic. Maybe God's brought you here for that purpose, for us to lovingly challenge you and to begin to forge that relationship, to speak lovingly the challenging things that help you grow. Who's in your life challenging you to rise above your circumstances, to manage your emotions, to manage your conduct, to manage your health, to trust in Jesus and to not look to other things for security, which we're all guilty of doing, aren't we? We look to relationships or money or success or power or popularity for control, for success, for some, or for some sort of peace, I mean, for security. Uh, we find our security in those things. It's just a new form of idolatry. Back in the day, they used to worship, uh, carve idols, and it was a representative of this God that they worshiped, and it was called idolatry. Today, it, we don't carve those things, but man, we worship relationships, money, success, power, popularity, and the list goes on. Do we have someone like a prophet saying, turn, turn from those things because they're empty? And then the other question is, how do you treat those people in your life that God may very well be sending into your life to guide you and to challenge you? Do you treat them like these tenants treated the servants of the owner? Do we, do we talk about them behind their backs? Do we, do we gossip about them? Do we put them down? because they had the audacity to challenge us? Do you slander them? Do you roll your eyes in disgust when they show up or if we're gonna have another conversation? Do you, do you become defensive and then go on the attack against people like that? Oh, well, you're so perfect or it must be so nice to have a, an easy life and we're just becoming defensive and we're sort of deflecting from when someone who's lovingly trying to say, we need to work on these areas in your life. Do you end up simply just not willing to be challenged. Maybe is that an attitude you've resolved? I, I'm just not willing to be challenged or corrected. Or do you find that being challenged in some of these, these closer to home areas, you know what I mean. There's, there's some things like, oh yeah, challenge me. We can, be, we can be cool and talk about some stuff. But then there's, there's those things that are close to home. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your children. There are those things that are close to home that they just, they dig a little deeper. And those are the ones where maybe we're going to be more offended or more easily offendable. Well, like the Pharisees, if you're saying, I don't need to learn anything, if you're saying, I don't want to be challenged in those areas, then like the Pharisees, the problem is pride. And the Bible has plenty to say about the dangers and the deception of pride, doesn't it? If that's you, man, I want to challenge you. It's time to pray. It's time to dig into that relationship with Christ. It's time to dig into your word. And it's time to find someone you can talk to and say, I, I think I need help. I think I'm prideful and I don't like to be challenged. And it's hard for me. And they can walk you through that process. If as you hear this message, this challenge, you find that maybe you're unsure. I, life is pretty good. I'm not, I'm not sure that I have anything going on, but I don't want to be blind to it. Then maybe it's worth finding someone that knows you well asking them some of these questions and then giving them permission to really speak honestly and boldly into your life. Again, we're trying to grow. We're trying to grow. And if it's just you, sometimes there may be blind spots there. So in conclusion, we as the church, corporately and individually, we're supposed to be good tenants of this vineyard that God has entrusted to us. There's supposed to be a good story here. We're not supposed to be like the wicked, selfish ones that Jesus portrays here in Mark chapter 12. And in many ways, this is a wake-up call for us. I know when I was reading and studying and praying about this, it's a wake-up call. How do we treat people that God has put in our life? How do I treat the people that God has put in my life? How do you treat these people? And, and or do we even recognize that God has put them there? I mean, there may be people that aren't even Christ followers in your life, rubbing you the wrong way, challenging your faith, but it's an opportunity for growth for you where God's going to say, how are you going to respond? Are you gonna love the unlovely? Are you, going to, are you gonna do good to those that spitefully use you or do good to those that treat you poorly and be a light for me because they're hurting and they need to see how a Christ-centered person responds to the things that happen in life? Do we recognize that God is putting these people in our life so as we close, and I really hope that you'll chew on this and wrestle with this challenge today, journal on it, 
Um, pray about it. Go over this parable and ask the Lord to reveal things to you. Man, as we close, I can't help but think of Romans chapter 2. In the New Living, it says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? In other translations, uh, in the ESV certainly, it says, Don't you know that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? And so let's not fight the, the prophets that are in our life. You know what I mean? Let's not fight those people that God may be using in our life to challenge us, to sharpen us, to strengthen us to grow. Because don't we know that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, to change, to turn directions and face towards Him and say, okay, I'm, I'm all in and, and I'm willing to grow in this area. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that you love us, that you are patient and kind with us, that you love us enough to expose those things in our life that we would rather keep hidden or just ignore. But you love us enough to challenge us to grow. And I pray that we would take that challenge seriously, that we would grow, uh, that we would center our life around you, focus on you. Holy Spirit, we're going to need your grace to help us change, especially if we're struggling with anger and disappointment and hurt and frustration, which causes us to lash out rather than act uh, through the fruit of the Holy Spirit or act and live in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Lord, we need your grace. We need your help. And we know that you can and we know that you will. So we give this message to you that you would seal it up in the hearts of your people and that uh, people would honestly chew on Mark chapter 12 and wrestle with this and see the first honest, true layer of understanding, but then also to go deeper and say, uh, Lord, I don't want to be like those wicked tenants with something you've entrusted to me. So I pray that we would grow in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Sing.